We think of observability as the ability to do open-ended exploration. What do I mean by that? It's, uh, you know, we're ingesting all this data, we talked about the volume, but then people need to make sense of it. You know, they need to explore the data. When, you know, pr problems happen in the network, you want to be as, quickly, as quick as possible to figure out what's going on. And so we have this uh, notion of, uh, you know, we call it data explorer. It's this uh, ability to very quickly and openly explore your network data and figure out what might be going on in real time. Hi, this is your host, Sapnil Bharatiya, and we are here at KubeCon in Chicago. And today we have with us Christoph Fister, Chief Product Officer at Kentec. Christoph, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, and it's my pleasure to host you today. And if I'm not wrong, this is the first time I'm talking to someone from Kentec. That's a problem. <laughs> I'm glad you do. But that also means that uh, we have now cracked open the door and I can see there are a lot of things that you folks are doing, which means that there are a lot to talk about. But let's start with uh, some basics, which is talk a bit about what do you folks do? What is Kentic all about? Right, so Kentic uh, is a company focused on network observability. So basically think of it as an observability company, but with a network first approach. You know, there's many companies out there that do APM, application level observability. There's very few that are focused on the network. And, um, you know, the reason, part of the reason for that is that network is a very, um, you know, complex space, very high cardinality data. And so, um, you know, many observability, traditional observability, observability backends, they choke a little bit when, uh, you know, they see all this network telemetry. So we ingest, um, you know, flow, VPC flow, SNMP, of course, uh, eBPF now, we'll talk about Cube uh, in a bit. And, uh, you know, we uh, ingest all that into a big data backend, and then we help our customers do analytics uh, on that data. Now, you know, to give you a sense of the volume that we're talking about, so we did some checking last year alone, we ingested um, 200 trillion with a T, uh, telemetry records. So I'll do some math for you. That's about uh, <laughs> six million per second. Uh, and so you can imagine that's you know really really high volume uh, type stuff. And that's why we think we're a little bit uh, unique and a little bit different. Now, since we are here at this event, talk a bit about what is the importance of events like these, and so far, what has been your observation? No pun intended. Yeah, it's pretty early days, uh, but it's crowded. That's good. Uh, you know, lots of momentum and excitement in the ecosystem and the community. Uh, we love that. Yesterday I was at uh, Cilium uh, Day. I don't know if you're, you know, the, the new uh, uh, CNI basically, or one of the CNI is very popular. Uh, and they do uh, also EB, uh, EBF based uh, approaches, right? And so uh, we're very uh, similar. I, um, you know, I think Kubernetes in particular, you know, has become kind of a, you know, operating system for the cloud, right? And uh, it allows people and uh, companies to, you know, bit more, be a bit more cloud independent. You know, whether you run on AKS or EKS or uh, uh, G, uh, GK, the Google stuff. And that's one of the things that uh, we help customers with, meaning we support uh, all of these you know, backends and clouds with our uh, Kubernetes approach. But let me talk a little bit about observability. We have been talking about observability at TFR for a very long time, but we have not talked a lot about network observability. What is it? So let's talk about our approach to uh, observability. So one of the things we think we do slightly differently, and uh, there's one other company in the APM space who has a similar definition as we do. So we think of observability as the ability to do open-ended exploration. What do I mean by that? It's, uh, you know, we're ingesting all this data, we talked about the volume, but then people need to make sense of it. You know, they need to explore the data. When, you know, pr problems happen in the network, you want to be as, quickly, as quick as possible to figure out what's going on. And so we have this uh, notion of, uh, you know, we call it data explorer. It's this uh, ability to very quickly and openly explore your network data and figure out what might be going on in real time. 
you know, that's very different from just looking at a dashboard or, um, you know, looking at uh, some alerting. We actually allow customers to dig into all this massive data and figure out what's going on. And we think that's uh, very differentiated. And then, as I said, you know, networks have huge volumes. And so, you know, that's why uh, probably, um, you know, Kentik is one of the only companies that, uh, you know, does this stuff well. What does that mean for the whole ecosystem if you are the only folks who are doing it, does that mean that there are a lot of awareness, education needed in the space? Or you see that, no, a lot of groundwork has already been laid and your potential customers actually are not talking about what it is, but they are talking more about, hey, give us the tools that we need. Talk about the state of network observability. Yeah, so I uh, will start with uh, maybe another statistic. We have uh, well over 400, 400 customers, so we're not, you know, small. Uh, many customers, you know, we started with service providers, then we went to what you call the digital enterprise, which is basically the SaaS companies of this world. So, you know, whether it's a Salesforce or a Booking.com or a Zoom, they're all Kentic customers. Why? Because the network is fundamental to their business. Where we have a bit more education to do is in the more traditional enterprise, because these traditional enterprises have been focused mostly on their on-prem networks, and now all of a sudden, you know, they get you know these cloud um, workloads, they get Kubernetes workloads, you know, there's the internet that's becoming the new backbone, and so how do you get visibility into all of that? And that's where we have education to do now. You may have or may not, may have not uh, seen some articles in the uh, New York Times or Wall Street Journal about Kentic. Why is that? It's because we have very unique insight into the internet. We are peered with thousands of networks. And so when something breaks in Ukraine or a subsea cable to St. Helena, you know, has a problem, we see the traffic impact and the latency impact in public clouds, as an example. And that is a very unique value proposition. That's why, you know, customers rely on our, us and our capabilities. Did you folks make any announcement here at the show? Yes. So we announced uh, what we call Kentic Cube, pun intended. <laughs> and uh, Kentic Cube is a way to, uh, uh, you know, extend our value proposition into the Kubernetes, Kubernetes ecosystem. Now, there's plenty of companies who do uh, Kubernetes observability, but what they're missing and what we add and what we do in terms of value is that with Kentic, you can look not just at your uh, you know, clusters, but you can see what your clusters and pods, uh, you know, who, uh, who they talk to. Meaning, if you're interested, if you know, one of your pods talks to an embargoed country, or if there's uh, you know, cross-region traffic uh, originating by one of your pods or containers, uh, which is something that costs money, and maybe a problem, you know, we're, we think we're probably the only ones who uh, can give you that visibility. Because we stitch together the Kubernetes telemetry, which we get through eBPF, with all the context and the data we have from the internet, from public clouds, and so on, and provide a much broader uh, picture in terms of what's going on with your uh, Kubernetes installations. Kentic started almost in the same year when Kubernetes CNCF came to exist, and you folks both have K in your name. But a lot of things have changed ever since observability has evolved. Talk a bit about how network observability has evolved over time, or what does network observability mean for this changing landscape? Yeah, very good question. So, you know, the way I would frame it is that for the network, people, especially in the enterprise, less so service providers, but in the enterprise, used to be focused on their on-prem stuff. You know, they had full control. And then, you know, companies started to get interested in cloud and deploy cloud workloads. And initially, let's take AWS as an example. You know, people had one account, uh, a few VPCs, and everything was hunky-dory. But nowadays, you know, there's customers who have, you know, thousands of accounts or in Azure, you know, subscriptions, uh, whatever, the, uh, the, uh, the cloud calls it, thousands of accounts. Uh, the you know, underlying technology is very complex. You have transit gateways, you have VPN gateways, you have firewalls now. And so all of a sudden, you know, what used to be meant as kind of an abstraction is becoming, oh, it's a real network. 
and you have to manage it and there's you know connectivity issues and you have to configure it and you have to make sure everything the traffic flows and so i think that is a very key difference from like a few years ago that people start realizing that hey you know cloud is not the nirvana there's work to be done you need to actually be able to make sure that you observe your network especially when it comes to hybrid cloud uh, connectivity like is my traffic actually flowing back to my data center or wherever i need it to go and you know because we have this unique visibility into the clouds into kubernetes workloads into data centers and also the internet which has become of the kind of the new backbone for companies we think we can provide some pretty unique uh, value to customers i want to talk about some emerging trends and technologies of course <laughs> i'm looking at generative ai talk a bit about what does generative ai mean for network observability and what does network observability mean for generative ai workloads yeah i'm glad you asked so look um like many observability companies we've been doing you know machine learning anomaly detection baselining all these things for a long time uh we call them insights and uh you know we crunch all the data we have and we provide uh insights uh to customers about what's going on on their network now with gen ai i think one of the biggest short term um values that uh that can provide is the ability to uh we call it lower the barriers to entry so i talked about this data exploration uh you know kentic has a, a data explorer uh it is pretty intuitive but still there's a bit of a learning curve like what if you could ask kentic uh in natural language you know what are the devices with the highest cpu utilization on my network you know which are uh the interfaces that have most uh, traffic and then the gen ai the language model translate that natural natural language into the query that then gets executed and then the result comes back so for us gen ai in the first incarnation is all about lowering the barriers to entry to observability tools like kentic uh we have uh, some pretty exciting work in uh, in the oven around this kind of stuff Uh, we just released some stuff privately to some customers to help us uh, test accuracy because you want to make sure that you know whatever you put in uh, the re- uh, the right results come back out uh, and we'll make some announcements here pretty soon about uh, this kind of stuff so pretty exciting no of course you folks are always working on the next thing there are a lot of things in your pipeline you may or may not be able to share at this point of course we'll talk about them when they're ready but just give us a teaser a glimpse of what kind of things we should expect from kentic i talked about uh, natural language and that's obviously just the first step if you think about troubleshooting for networks or for any other uh, complex system It really is a a sequence of questions you ask. You know, you ask a question, you get a result, you you drill into some more detail, you branch off into some other um, you know, question uh questioning and so on. And so the ability to do that uh you know, and correlate for the engineer all the different things that uh um you know, uh get out data based on the question that he or she is asking uh is we think a um uh a way to again lower the barriers barriers to entry now you know if you have enough of these we call them journeys uh as an example uh you know we believe that eventually by training the model on enough of these journeys that customers do so think about a customer asking you know 100 users having 100 uh questions a day about their network you know that becomes pretty big data set And so if you can train the model on this data set eventually the model might be able to go from answer directly to solution. And so it's kind of the holy grail of uh, root cause analysis that this industry have been tra- has been trying to you know deliver on for a very long time. I've yet to meet a customer who says, "Hey, root cause analysis is, you know, my root cause analysis is great because it's not." And so we think that Gen AI and large language models uh, can help with that over time. Christoph, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about network observability and as we can clearly see there are a lot of things that you folks are working on. So I'm looking forward to talk to you folks soon again. Thank you. I I hope so. Thanks for the great conversation. 